I stand before you as a proud black female filmmaker. Love on the tooth, but still telling my stories, proudly standing tall. I'm so um, pleased to be able to be in this moment and uh, to experience the space that's being afforded us now as women. Um, I really want to thank Babu for understanding the importance of our film and supporting it. It's really important to have allies like Babu and the Santua, so thank you. There are a couple other people I want to thank quickly. Um, I want to thank uh, Nikolai for working with me for five years on the movie. I say it's Steve from California Pictures, our distributor. <coughs> Imagine Media, um, Lisa Wickham. Republic Bank, Jornal Tobago that funded us. Telephone Canada, I'm also a proud Canadian, as well as a Trinidadian. Um, Dalia Fernandez, I just want to acknowledge all the people who are part of our team that actually came here to be part of this experience with us. Um, so Dalia, I mean, we were a big team, we, we shot all over the place. Uh, <coughs> but I just want to acknowledge those who are here. Dalia Fernandez, our logistics coordinator, Mary Wells, our associate producer, Albert, who came all the way from Ghana. <laughs> Kevin Pennant, um, um, our publicist, Fenella, Bruce, also my publicist, and um, finally, I just want to say quickly a few words about what, why I made the film. Um, I always say that this film was inspired by my ancestors. My mother is the person that they sit on my shoulders and they told me what story to tell. My mother is the person who insisted that I make this film. Ulrich Cross was a friend of my family, Uncle Ulrich to me. And uh, originally I didn't want to tell the story, but when I began to research it, this whole world emerged. That then became you know, something that I had to do um, for them and uh, for history. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can is everybody who goes out, can you quietly go out and uh, so we can start the discussion? What did you say? It's got to go because those people got to go go to work tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. First of all, let's give these folks a hand again. Francis Van Sullivan, Mr. Salcido. This is the this I mean, you just saw this incredible work. How long did it take you to do that? Eight years. Wow. Eight years. And another, another four or five years thinking about it. Another four or five years really conceptualizing and thinking about it. Um, First, first, why don't you talk a little bit about the journey, the experience, and then talk about your experience as an actor, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Can, but everybody, please kind of be quiet as you go out and save some food for these folks. <laughs> can we get some water, please, up here? Somebody who works with us? So everybody, can, we're supposed to be 10 bottles of water up here. Okay, go ahead, Francis, and tell us about... Well, as I hinted before um, the film, the journey started with my mother, Ulrich Cross, who was a friend of my family. She was, uh, he was Al Uncle Ulrich to me. I knew him well, he was part of my extended family. And um, at a certain point in time, another friend of our family is called Desmond Allen. He was a lawyer. 
and he was dying. And uh, he called my mother, um, literally sort of the day before he died, and he said, I want you to make sure that before you go, you get a film made about Alric Cross. Of course, that was his way of saying that they wanted me to do it, you know, because I'm the filmmaker in the family. Um, so my mother actually raised money, and, and I got on, came on board to, to help her. Um, I didn't know much about Ulrich really, you know, he was, he was one of those old guys, very genteel, um, very proper, very British. Uh, I knew they had served in the war. I didn't want to make a film about black people getting killed in a white people's war anymore. I've already done that. Um, but when I began to research the story, I discovered that after the war, he was recruited by another Trinidadian, George Padmore, who was one of the architects of Pan-Africanism and the mentor of Kwame Nkrumah to go to Africa, to go to Ghana on independence, and then Nkrumah sent him all over the continent. And it was really about, he wasn't alone, it was about the role of Caribbean intellectuals and professionals in the African liberation movements, and that then became a story that I needed to tell, you know? So that's how it came about. I was thinking what have you learned from his energy, which invaded your consciousness, obviously. Um, so it's funny. I was I was actually a musician before I started getting into acting, and, and by the time Francis San approached me, the hero hero was having auditions for a room. I had locks uh, reaching halfway down my back. And I could not audition, obviously, because it's a period piece. Uh, the second time around, they were having auditions, and I had freshly cut my locks off. And I went, I did a reading for it, and Francis, Francis ended up choosing me for it. This experience, I would say, I keep telling people, he will kind of change my life, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it introduced me to the world. Uh, it gave me, gave me the chance to travel and meet actors from, you know, different walks of life and meet African actors. Actors from across the African diaspora in Britain, in Ghana. Uh, and that really just opened me up to like, all the possibilities, you know. But it kind of, in a way, it kind of gave me a Pan-African outlook. You know, I, I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago with a very African conscious background. But, you know, to actually experience Pan-Africanism in a living way, uh, having to work on a story that is about Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. and having to interact with people from various backgrounds that are just like myself. You know, it was really moving and touching and this really showed me what the possibilities are, you know. So Hero was a very revolutionary experience for me. Yeah. How many people in the audience were familiar with these these people in the film? George Padmore, C.R. James, Eduardo Matalan, do you want to kind of tell a little bit, Francis, who these people are, so they can kind of help? By the way, you can find out two ways to find out about these people. One, you can go to your library, the major university, UCLA, USC, LA City <laughs> College, and those libraries have tons of books. And also you can go to the SY Bookstore, the Black Bookstore in the Merck Park, SY Bookstore. And uh, they have those uh, C.L.R. James there. Uh, by the way, I want to just say one thing. In light of um, America is, is really caught up with sports and athletics. And uh, we just had the tragic death of Kobe a few, weeks, a few days ago. You saw the whole outpouring of his life and so forth. But one thing that was sort of missing, and I used to play basketball, and uh, Danny used to play football. And I tried. <laughs> <laughs> he, he has a story about his encounter with O.J. Simpson. Let's get this straight. On football, right? <laughs> we don't need to crease the ball. <laughs> so, you know, we, we began to have a certain amount of awareness about our life through sports. 
Uh -huh. But C.L.R. James mm -hmm. is the person who wrote the definitive book on the Haitian Revolution. It's called The Black Jacobins. You can get that book at S1 Bookstore. They, he decided in the 1930s to write that book because they were the only slaves in the history of the world to ever get free and stuff in another nation. The only ones, which is why they've been, why they've suffered since then. Are there any um, professors in the audience, I mean, teachers of uh, university professors may be involved in um, African studies? This film would be a great departure. Oh, well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember reading Julius Nyeri's African Socialism in 1967. I was taking a class in comparative, comparative African economies, that's my degrees in economics. And I read African Socialism. I was I was read African Socialism, and that's why I majored in economics, because I read African Socialism. It's so much that just, this film, because it, 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 it brings, brings out, we listen to the names, Babu and many people in the audience have heard these names over and over and over in our own political life, you know, for, for since, you know, over more than 50 years. You know, it's, it's, it's when you brought in 1963, you need to tell a story about, uh, um, I'm, 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 my mind's going great. You brought him to City College in LA, 1963, uh, uh, from the ANC. Oh, uh, Oliver Tambo. Huh? Oliver Tambo. Oliver Tambo. Who was Mr. Mandela? There's a story about him bringing Oliver Tambo to City College in 1963. There were a handful of students. Right. He stayed the whole two, three hours exactly. talking to the students. This is long before the freedom of Mandela. And most of us, well, most of the people, the old idea of, of end of apartheid. But it, this draws on every, the key moments in this whole idea of Pan-Africanism, whether it's Nkrumah, who went to Lincoln University yeah. Yeah. along with the same person, Langston Hughes went to Lincoln University, Gerbert Marshall went there, Julian Bond's father was the president of, <laughs> of Lincoln University. Check this out. That, that conference in Manchester, we talk about that conference in Manchester, and so on, who was there? Robeson was there, Paul Robeson was there, W.B. Du Bois was there. Paul Robeson and, and Du Bois had formed the Council on African Affairs in 1939, anticipating after the war the struggles for nationalism, nation, nation state, the struggles in the colonialism, you know. And there's a, there's a whole discussion that this whole, this could be a course study for a semester or a year. And you just, as, it, just, just using the film. Yes. There's a platform of going to every aspect of that. Right. And so it, this is not how films are used right. often. We told that they have to have some sort of quote unquote arc. <laughs> you know, no. a dramatic arc, not historical arc. This is next. But this is it. And to follow this process, and I'm sure that to, to understand all those things, to touch and, and, and understand the kind of radicalism, post-World War II radicalism, the world was, the world was in shambles. The colonial powers couldn't exert their, their power anymore. You know, the Vietnamese had defeated, the, in 1954, had defeated the French at Dien Bien Phu. All this stuff, China had, China had now, had now, I won this war, the Chinese Revolution, victorious in 1949. All these things came. And then we put up there, guess who was at, guess who was in, 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 in Accra in 1957 at the, at the independence of Ghana, Martin Luther King. Back to Boom. 
story. Can you put it all, put in all the pieces connecting the dots? And he talked with, with Elric and all those folks. That's that. How many people hear a speech every year at the March on Washington, right? Because a part of that speech is that he says wherever freedom is, whether you're in Johannesburg, South Africa, or Miss Jackson, Mississippi, or Montgomery, Alabama, the cry is all the same. He consciously put that in there because he was influenced by Judge Cross, George Padmore, and those people. He wrote, by the way, most of his books in Jamaica because he needed to have a space of freedom, the consciousness to do that. Fred then, were you aware as you made that film and, and wanted to show those, those, those great moments, um, how did you do it? What, what advice do you have for other folks who want to do that, tell this kind of story? What, how did you put those kind of great moments together and make it real? I mean, how many people thought it was real that she caught the spirit? Woo! It became, um, once I began to, to research his life, and I was blown away by, he was like Forrest Gump, right, but black. He was everywhere that something important was happening in, in the black world in, in a certain period, and it was an incredible period. It was a moment when the world changed, um, and Oliver Cross was right there in the middle of it all the time. Um, it became clear that I couldn't tell his story without actually telling, like really contextualizing each of those places and contextualizing the development of the movement that created Padmore and so on, um, and Padmore's relationship with, and show how it was with Nkrumah, and show how it was a global movement that kind of coalesced at a specific moment in time and then just exploded. Um, so the history became as important as the man's story because you can't understand the significance of him without under really understanding in depth the history. And then the challenge was how do you make that entertaining? How do you make it a good story uh, that people will want to watch on film? How do I do that? Tell a story across across uh, you know basically four continents, at least four. Um, you know the Caribbean, England, Africa. I guess it was three. Um, with a tiny budget and through force of necessity. I've also I've used that technique before actually. I love reclaiming archive of the past and putting my characters into it because you know the Second World War we're so often left out of that. Mm -hmm. And even um, independence in Ghana, it's not widely known that Caribbean people, that Americans were right there on the ground at that moment in time. Um, so actually reclaiming history and putting my characters who I love and who I want you to care about right into history was a way of um, a kind of terrorism, a kind of, um, you know, Banksy, uh, kind of, you know, kind of saying, fuck you with your, um, your invisibilizing of our stories. We were there. We were there all the time. Yeah, that, 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 that became a style of its own. Um, and weaving in and out of archive to the personal, personal political, personal political, and back and actually finding archive, for example, of Tanzania Airport in 1974, of all these specific moments was, was like an archaeological trip on its own. Yeah. We're going to open up this, the uh, discussion so everybody can line up here, and I'll give you when you ask a question, then you can pass it off. So, and we're going to do it as long as you want to stay. We'll do that. And hopefully, there'll be some food safe for you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. First of all, I want to congratulate you all on such an interesting, informative, and educational movie. Quick question. There were so many literally, literal um, graves mentioned from Trinidad and that um, movie. Vivian Ipoil, I saw Vivian Ipoil, and yeah, yeah. we talk about Sierra James and the Padmore family, yes. who I'm quite familiar with yes. from Aruka. Yes, exactly. but, um, what plans do you have to, since it's so educationally informative, and you know in Trinidad, uh, 
high school level, even A levels. Yeah. We're so in tune with history. Do you plan on doing a book? Absolutely, yeah, for sure. So yeah, that we can study it in the high school. Right now, we're doing um, a theatrical. You know, we're doing festival circuit, theatrical releases. We did a release in the UK. Our distributor, Steve of California Pictures, is going to be working with us for the worldwide distribution. Thank you, Steve. And then we are going to be um, definitely developing educational tools um, so that it can be used in school. Which is really, really yeah, good. It is. And, uh, it is important. I just want to speak to that. You know, our young people know so little about uh, their history. Right. It's really tragic. Um, you know, they're fed a constant diet in the media of gangs and, mm -hmm. and hip hop, which yeah. nothing against hip hop, please. But um, right. gangs, drugs, you know, uh, sports, that's all we can be. And, you know, my experience growing up in the Caribbean was that, you know, my ancestors were great leaders, intellectual thinkers, strategists who, who changed the world almost single handedly. They were. So I really, one of the goals was really to transform the image of black men. Amen. I want to say, Danny, it's nice to see you again. We met in Bermuda not too long ago. <laughs> 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 you went down with me? No. Bermuda. Bermuda. Uh, so she met him. At Diamonds and Caviar, my son went. We all went to Bermuda. About two years ago. <laughs> 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 I get to see you if she like it. Okay, so she met him. <laughs> <laughs> Diamonds and Caviar. <laughs> Uh, let me, what I want to say, I forgot to mention the connection between sports and politics with C.L.R. James. He wrote, you know, most of us see sports as a way to make money and become a professional so forth and so on. We don't connect sports to the social political society. His first person that had an effect on us, he wrote a book called Beyond the Boundaries. You can find that in any major library. And he took, he, first of all, he was number one and number two cricket player in the world. He also hides up 6'4", 6'5", six, six, and 19 wow. Then he also went and wrote books. So he started to analyze the situation, and he wrote how colonialism works in the athletic situation. It made us begin to understand our relationship to sports and how that worked out. And now he, then he wrote The Haitian Revolution. So there is a way that you don't just have sports over here. You can really connect sports with life and with the politics of mobilizing. Thank you, first of all, for, uh, for telling this story. Um, I am the, uh, the son of a, a Jamaican mother and a Nigerian father um, who returned, who took us back to Nigeria in the, uh, in the 70s and joined, um, and joined the movement for, um, for the betterment of, uh, of Nigeria as well and, and was in political office. And so, so this is very much a reflection not only of of, of Mr. Cross's or Judge Cross's story, but a reflection of the story and, and, and those of us who grew up at that time and who were taken back by our parents to do the very same thing that um, unfortunately we were not necessarily successful in, um, in fully accomplishing everything that we wanted to accomplish, but I wanted to thank you for, for that. Um, I also am a filmmaker and a, a professor in the Pan-African Studies Department at uh, Cal State LA as well, so um, I would love to, to take this um, I want to find out how we can get this film um, for the department, the Pan African Studies Department at Cal State LA, and um, and how I can show this film to my father, who is um, in his 80s now. Um, and I think this would be something that uh, to, for him to know that that legacy has actually been captured on on film um, is it, just um, just incredible to me because I have a better understanding of who he was and what he did by watching this film. So so you've honored many people in this. Uh, through making this film, and uh, so I just want to say that and ask, and ask how we can um, yeah, we can help um, about it, yeah. put the film out in the world and have other people yeah, um, see absolutely. it. I just want to say that that is the story of a lot of people, a lot of us. See, like for example, my grandfather in Shonan, who's one of the architects of independence. There's a lot of people who have links um, all over the world to that particular period. You know, where people were born of Africa and Caribbean, and it's something that's not widely Unknown, and what the feedback that I've got is that often, you know, from a lot of people, is it ha has helped contextualize my life. 
you know, things that I that I view as part of my personal life and put them into political context. You know, so and it's great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, definitely that's true. Hi, my name is Tanae. Thank you so much for this film. So powerful. I really wanted you to talk more about the archival. Um, how difficult was it to find those archival pieces? Um, what were your sources? Uh, were you surprised by it, any of your sources? I really loved how you used the archival and interwove it, and we really felt like we were there. Mm -hmm. um. It's something that I've done before. I kind of do it in all my films, is take reality and put people into it, people that I know into it, personalize it. Because growing up, we didn't have images of ourselves to look at, whether in the movies or in books or anything like that, right? So um, as soon as I became a filmmaker, um, a kind of immediate response was to grab those images that are very common and put us into it because we were there, as I said. In terms of how difficult it was to find, it was a hell of a lot easier than, than I, it would have been if I had tried to raise, you know, three million, five million dollars in order to shoot period on three continents, you know? So it became a way of saving money, of creating, you know, worlds, period, um, periods that have, or no longer exist. Um, um, around the world, creating those realities um, cheaply, yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, it's its 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 own style, and I'm proud of it, I love it. I wouldn't, uh, I think it would take something away from it at this point to have shot it, period, you know. I want people to think all the time that this was real, that these places were real, that this was actually happening all the time, um, because they were. But yeah, it was very hard to find the archive, yeah. Uh, thank, uh, thank you again for uh, the wonderful movie. I'm from. Uh, yes, I'm the Consul General for Ethiopia, and uh, uh, thank you, thank you for inviting us and uh, uh, being, um, uh, you know, make us reflect on the 20th century revolution in Africa, where most African countries become independent. Uh, and we are halfway there, the 20th century revolution that you narrated in your movie uh, kind of brought the uh, political independence, but the economic independence is yet to appear in Africa again. Institutions uh, are yet to be built, and uh, the African um, uh, people are yet to secure the economic independence. And we knew the second revolution, and in that revolution, we went to see the second world of the African diaspora, both in the Caribbean and in the U.S. and everywhere around the world, to get involved in the economic liberation of Africa and become uh, make the 21st century uh, an African century. Um, that is uh, really one of the takeaway uh, for me, and I encourage you to. Um, publicize this movie back in Africa. Uh, you know, as Ethiopian, we host the African Union. One of the narratives you built uh, in that OAU was the creation of these revolutionary leaders, and now it is called African Union, and, and it is a tremendous progress. So uh, we need uh, to reframe our narratives, retell our stories as Africans uh, without any. Uh, divisions both here and there. Thank you again. Um, yeah. I will say that one of the, one of the function, purposes for me of the film was to show how the Afri African liberation movement was undermined at its source right from the beginning mm -hmm. by the forces of imperialism because they did not want to give up the resources in Africa. And because I think it's important for people to understand how ca young people to understand how capitalism works. Um, to benefit, um, you know, the one percent or whatever, um, and, and, and that they killed our leaders systematically, um, and how devastating that was to the movement. But that is a mantle that we need to pick up now, as you say, that we have the internet and we have a lot more resource. And it's important, maybe with with an understanding of what happened before to our great leaders, we can now achieve what was lost then. Uh, I, was, uh, I was at a conference sponsored on the 
African blood. But it won't mean anything if there's no thinking behind it. And I'm interested in whether or not um, there's just some thoughts that you've come across in pulling this film together that touch on that and what people should be thinking about now and what people should be doing now. And I'm saying we. Um, yeah, the idea, I, what I wanted to show was, you know, the, the idea of the United States of Af Africa, you know, when you hear about it now, um, some people think it's a joke or something, you know. It's hard to believe that that was, but I wanted to show that the best thinkers across the continent and the diaspora sat down and actually worked it out. That we could be the United States of Africa like the United States of America, that we could have a common currency, that we could defend each other, that we could have free trade and open borders and support each other and build Africa e economically using the resources of all the people of African heritage who are dispersed around the world. That's a very viable concept. Um, <clears throat> And it's tragic that it was destroyed like that. But yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that young people today may still come together. Why not? Um, and the next generation will will pick up the mantle of leaders mm -hmm. and make the effort to overcome the divisions that have been created by colonialism to unite and build the continent. You know, and that has started actually this year in Ghana. You had the year of the return. Uh, which is a beautiful concept, you know, um, uh, the Prime Minister of among many beautiful things that happened. Um, basically, Ghana offered any person of African heritage the right to go back to Ghana and become a citizen. That's such a beautiful, when you think about all the, the, um, the kind of um, xenophobia that is you know, driving the West, mm -hmm. the way that immigrants are scorned and being blocked and being vilified, the idea that, that Ghana would take the step of actually saying, come home, right. you can, be you belong here, right. you can claim this as your sanctuary, um, is, is a very beautiful one. So I think that there is a consciousness rising. And you know, like that, the, our Prime Minister of Barbados, um, Caribbean Prime Minister, took the remains of the unknown African slave back to Ghana and buried him. That we, we make the links. There's been a huge dishonor done to us, a huge wound created by slavery that we've never had an opportunity to heal from. And, um, and if, yeah, that's just, it's an important part of our, of our journey to do that. I think that, yeah, it's, I, I, I agree, I think that as people of the African diaspora who have not been, 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 had an opportunity to learn about what happened, you know, this hidden history that has not been celebrated, that has not been documented, people like that more, have pretty well dropped off the map in terms of, you know, there's not in any history books, uh, mainstream does not document this movement. They, they document empire from the point of view of Britain, but they don't, they fought, you know, but they don't document how we fought. It's the same thing with slavery, right? They, they say about these white people who, who you know, will be forced and those people who wrote about the other slavery that isn't. It was, it was rebellions, you know? So it's the same thing. We actually negotiated and, and won freedom, and it's important to understand how and why that was undermined and destroyed at its root by the forces of greed just it was pure greed. Africa is the most valuable property on the planet. So they had no intention of giving up their, their holdings there and they would go to any length to prevent it, you know, to prevent us owning our own resources. It's important for you. Because otherwise we go around feeling bad and thinking why why do we fight each other? Why are we not running our countries properly? Why are we unable to you know to do things? We we are not allowed to have the resources to do it. And it's really important to understand how that functions so that we can, you know, begin to fight against it. Thank you so much. Thank you.